Hello, and welcome to Lang Time Chat, episode 45. Uh, today is going to be a little bit different. We've only done this once before. I am hosting this podcast episode on my own, so I'm going solo today. And uh, in case you did not recognize my voice, that means you are with Jesse only. Uh, David will not be joining me today. And there's a reason for that. It's because um, what I am doing in this episode is meant to be a surprise for David. And so to give you a little bit of context, um, first and foremost, the topic of today, I've uh, titled this episode Translation as a Language Expanding Exercise. And so what I'm going to be doing is showing how you can use translation of a particular passage or, or phrase or story or whatever to actually build your language and features of your language. Um, of course, that means you need to have a start to it. If you don't have a language yet, then um, this would be a very difficult exercise indeed. And so um, to, to go into the context of what I'm actually doing today, um, I'm gonna back up a little bit on a personal note. Um, today, to situate you in our timeline of the world, today is um, October 27th. It is a Friday, and so this episode's gonna drop in like four days. Uh, in between now and then though is October 29th, and on o October 29th, David and I are getting married. And so on that day, I want to be able to uh, read a passage or, or a little something that I have translated into Jwadi for David. And in, in case you've forgotten, Jwadi is my personal conlang that I've been working on for a while. Um, I've kind of released bits here and there about Jwadi. I've written about it a couple of times on Fiat Lingua, and I used Jwadi as my Luxembourg language last year. I'll probably do that again this year for my kind of personal accounts for Luxembourg. Uh, but yeah, Jwadi is my language and um, it's very near and dear and personal to me. And so I wanted to um, be able to just read a little something to David on our wedding day in Jwadi. Now, as a reminder, I mentioned today is the 27th of October. We're getting married on the 29th, which means I have roughly... <laughs> well, less than 48 hours at this point. I have about 30 hours to do this translation. Um, and I, well, I mean, I'm just running out of time. Let's just be honest here. Uh, and so what my ultimate goal is, so what I really, really want to translate for him is actually a chorus of a song. And the song is um, Deeper Than the Holler by Randy Travis. And so this is a song that many of you may not be familiar with. It is a song I grew up with. Uh, when I grew up, I listened to a lot of country music. And so a lot of songs uh, that are specifically about the country and country living that came out in the 80s and 90s, so specifically that sort of like era of country music, really remind me of home. And if you remember anything about Shwadi, you may also remember that this language is sort of um, situated, so to speak, in a Missouri-like air area. And so it is also something that reminds me a lot of home, as in the home I grew up in. And so I thought it would be really appropriate to uh, situate, not only since my language is situated there, um, I thought that the what I translated would be really cool if it were something that also reminded me of home, but was also something that, um, you know, was, was something about love and whatnot. I adore the song Deeper Than the Holler. I, I love Randy Travis. And um, I introduced this song to David, and so he had actually never heard it before I introduced him to it. And um, in it, the like the the full song, you know, Randy Travis is singing about how you know people compare love to all these things, but you know, I want to talk about love in my own terms and things that I understand. And so the chorus goes, my love is deeper than the holler, stronger than the river, higher than the pine trees growing tall upon the hill. My love is purer than the snowflakes that fall in late December and honest as a robin on a springtime windowsill and longer than the song of a whippoorwill. 
So like my ultimate goal is to have this whole chorus translated into Zhuadi. I myself, as a person who undertakes large projects um, and jumps into them, am willing to admit that this is perhaps too much for the next 30 hours, <laughs> given the fact that, well, throughout this podcast, we're going to be talking about all the things I don't have yet in Zhuadi. And so um, this this may be a bit too much for now. So this may be something that um, is a, I don't know, first anniversary gift to David uh, or a, hey, we've been married a week gift to David. Uh, so So this big goal may have to be put off a bit. So I have a backup plan. My backup plan is to shorten the chorus down and only do my love is deeper than the holler and longer than the song of a whippoorwill, um, which is the beginning line of the chorus and the ending line of the chorus smashed together as one sort of complete sentential kind of unit. And so that is my backup plan. I like this backup plan because it has two of my favorite lines of the chorus in it. And so it's kind of perfect. Um, I'm, I don't think David had ever really heard of or known what a holler was before he met me. Uh, but where I grew up, we had a holler right behind our house. And so this also reminds me of home. It's very appropriate, very nostalgic. Um, and it makes my heart smile. And that's what Joadi is all about. And also, I grew up every summer listening to the songs of the whippoorwills that filled, you know, my nighttime music in our forests uh, in, in Missouri. And so I love that, that this includes this lyric includes the whippoorwill in there. So this is my backup plan. Again, I am able to say even doing this much in the next 30 hours is a lot because of some of the constructions and grammar decisions I have to make. And so I also have backup plan B, <laughs> which is to say, all right, forget the song. And I'm just going to say, we create joy together. I love you always and forever in Shwadi. Even this is going to require some work. And so there's, there's a lot of moving pieces here and a lot of contingency plans going on. Uh, specifically, the we create joy together line, you may be like, wow, that's sort of a random thing to, to pop out with. Um, but it is specifically tied to um, designs that are important to David and me. And so if you saw a, a post, gosh, it would have been in July, um, we posted uh, pictures of us getting tattoos together. And so I got David's name, well, the word in Shwadi that was inspired by David's name, it, it's Davida is the, the full word in Shwadi. And that means to create. And so I got that tattooed on my arm. So it's essentially like having David's name, but in my language on my arm. And then David got um, Jessie, uh, which is in high Valerian, which means joy or actually joyful. It means joyful, but for these intents and purposes, I'm just going to say it means joy as a noun. And so together it sort of means create joy. And so those are tattoos that we have. Now the wedding ring that I designed for David has those two glyphs and in between those two glyphs, so it's got my Joadi Davida glyph and David's High Valerian Jessie glyph. In between those two glyphs on David's ring is the symbol of the Gjellejoche, which is um, a place in Finland and it is actually where David proposed to me. And this Gjellejoke symbol is, um, it's actually based on the, the loop that they use to hold a rein as you're like reining reindeer, as you're, you know, like putting a rope on your reindeer, because apparently in Finland, anyone who owns reindeer, like lets them just roam. And so you, you often need to go get them and kind of lead them back home. And so the, this loop that you put on the rope so you can kind of harness them um, is the symbol that they adopted for the Gjellejoke location, again, where David proposed to me. So um, it's like a symbol, it, it symbolizes our proposal story, but it also is sort of symbolic of a joining together. And so um, I really like that. So that's why it's We Create Joy Together. Um, all of those elements then are represented um, on David's ring. So again, backup plan B. <laughs> Is to, is to do that. 
some facts about Shwadi. So as we're, we're getting into this, I just want to give some grammatical overviews of decisions I've already made and what I already have in place. And then we're going to talk about uh, what I need to put into place to make this translation happen. And I'm going to connect it to, again, ways to use translation to build out your language um, while not just translating word for word. So while making decisions in your translation to be sensitive to how you want your language to work. And so some facts about Jwadi is that uh, it is dominantly head final. And so it's got SOV word order. And so that's what shows up. I've got basic clause structures pretty much mapped out. Um, it's really once you get into finer tuning of say embedded clause structures and things like that, that I, I need to work on still. But it's dominantly head final. Uh, it's got post positions and those post positions um, evolved. They grammaticalized from verbs. And so, you know, it makes sense that they are placed behind the noun that they're that's their object. And then um, it's got modifier noun word order. Um, and so you see modifiers appearing before nouns uh, with nouns as the head word, you know, being at the end because, again, it's dominantly head final. In terms of how the nouns work, um, so all the decisions I've made so far are that uh, the root of the noun can be surrounded by affixes. And um, it's got sort of, when I think about how the nouns work, I think about these sort of positions that can be taken up by a class prefix, the root, and then a number suffix and a case suffix. And so first and foremost, foremost, I said for mouse. Oh, that is adorable. Too bad David isn't here to hear that. Uh, but anyway, first and foremost, I have a class prefix marking system for my nouns in Shwadi. Some roots are noun roots. They're really old roots that were just always nouns and sort of inherently belong to a class. But the majority of Jwadi nouns um, have an overt class marker on a root. And a lot of those roots are verbal in nature. Um, some of them are just, you know, a, a nominal root, but it still has, you know, an overt class marker to, to change its meaning. And there are 11 classes of nouns in Jwadi. So it's got a, a lot of classes. And so it's got a lot of ways that you can take a root and then sort of like um, derive a new meaning from that root to create a new word. Uh, it's a language that type that I get very excited about. I love working on this because it's a lot of fun to think about. You know, if I have this basic meaning for a root, what are all the ways I can mark it with my class prefixes that I have available to me to get a host of other meanings? And so it's a lot of fun to work with. But I do have 11 prefixes that again occur um, before the root. After the root, I have a number suffix. And so any unmarked form means that the, the noun is singular. Um, but then I also have a way to mark nouns for the plural. And there are actually five different plural suffixes. So it's not like there's just one that makes it plural. Um, there are five different plural suffixes that sort of create their own semantic interpretations as well. So it's another avenue for deriving specific interpretations uh, for how you want to use this noun in context. And then after that, I have a case suffix, which was developed much later in the language. And so it does not do the same things that class prefixes and number suffixes can actually affect the, the stress of the, the root and where, where stress falls. It will do a lot more sound changes because these are really old prefixes and suffixes that were added to the root early on in the language development before, you know, all these sound changes took a effect. But case markers were sort of added near the end. And so it really doesn't affect, um, you know, sound changes for the, the root forms as much. They're sort of popped on at the end in, in more regular fashions because they, they are newer developments in the language. These case markers actually came from post positions, and so they're derived from, um, from verbs, older verbs. There are five cases in Shwadi. The nominative case is the unmarked one, and so, you know, if, if there's no case marker, it's, it's meant to be nominative or subject case. There are marked cases for the accusative, genitive, 
instrumental, and then there is a case where it's dative and locative, which have been conflated. Originally, they came from two different cases, and over time, um, because they sounded so similar, they became conflated as one suffix, and so it's either dative, dative or locative when you see that particular case marker. So those are the nouns. Over on the verbs, the root can also be surrounded by affixes. Um, specifically, the root of a verb can be preceded by a subject prefix, and the subject prefixes um, will, will change those inflections, uh, reflect person, number, and then if it's a first person subject, inclusive and exclusive. And so those are the different ways um, that, that those subject prefixes reflect the, the subject information. Um, if it is a third person subject, then really what's happening is the class prefix that you see on the noun gets prefixed to the verbal root as well to, to make it, you know, like subject agreement. And so you'll see those same prefixes occurring on both noun and verb forms uh, to be used in different ways. After the root, there is a tense suffix. And in Joadi, there are um, two tenses. It's a non-future, future language. So if it's an unmarked uh, form for the root, that means it's non-future tense, and so either present or past. If it is marked with the future tense, then that means it's you know a future. And then there's also a suffix uh, for the infinitive form. And so it, it occurs in that sort of same position if, if it's meant to be infinitive. And then there's also a negation suffix. So I do have all of these in place. I've already got all of these forms made. So again, I can do basic clauses um, in Joadi. And so for if it's a basic clause, then it's just a matter of making sure I have all the words in the language uh, to be able to say it. And so I'm actually going to work through these translations and talk through my, my workflow process backwards, starting with backup plan B. I'm starting with backup plan B because the two sentences that I want to um, translate to serve as my, my secondary backup plan are both basic clause structures. So I don't need to do anything fancy. There's no embedding. There's no new constructions that I need to make. Really, it's just about making sure I have um, the, the lexicon, the vocab that I need, and that I've got ways to say the information. And so for we create joy together, I've already got a noun meaning joy, um, and I've already got a verb meaning create. That's David's name, Davida, right? So I've already got those two elements. And so I can say we create joy. What I'm missing is a way to say together. And so that is a, a vocab item that I need to create. Um, but to say we create joy, anjoam lo Davida is how you say that in joie. And so en joie is joy. It comes from the root joie, which is the same root that you see in joie. Uh, and so it's that same root, um, but it's got a different class prefix. The on um, changes the root joie, which joie means like heart or soul. En joie means um, joy. And then the M is the, the accusative marker there. So that's that's how the accusative case is marked on that particular form. So on Schwam, and then lo de vida. Lo means we, um, but specifically it's the inclusive we. And so it's that first person plural inclusive form. And then de vida, uh, that verb form that is actually built on the root ida, meaning to exist. And then da is a prefix that's a causative and it comes from the verb to spark or ignite and so um, it is a causative prefix for verb forms so ida on its own means to exist davida means to create because it's essentially you're sparking or causing the existence of something else and so that's where that verb comes from now i need together and I'm not going to fully create the form in this podcast, but I do want to walk you through my thought process because together um, is a, a very handy adverb to have, or if I decide to do it as a phrase, it will be very, very handy in general to have. So so this is a good thing to be expanding Joadi with right now. Um, and so... I had played around with some ideas of how it might be built off um, 
you know, thinking about bundles or thinking about units. Um, but I decided to look up because David and I are learning Finnish together and we both love Finland and, you know, the, the together symbol is rooted in a place in Finland. I thought, why not look up where Ustessa, which is the Finnish word for together, why not look up where that comes from and use that as inspiration to create the Jwadi word for together? And so I did. And Ustessa, again, the word for together in Finnish, it is actually the inessive form of Iksi. And Gosh, the sound changes that go into turning Uxi into Uxdessa. Phenomenal. Um, like, I, I can't even tell you how much I want to study all those sound changes to figure out how those forms came about. But Uxi in Finnish means one. And so it's literally breaks down into the inessive. Uh, so think of it as meaning like in one. And so it's like, saying together is you're you're in one and it's as the inessive form it kind of turns it into a locational sense right like it's um you do something in one place because it again it's got that that inessive case turning it into that that sort of sense and so i want to do the same thing in Jwadi again as a as a nod to finnish and finland and the symbol that is being used here specifically um, and that's all fine and good. I don't have an inessive case. However, I do have post positions in Shwadi, um, and I do have a post position uh, that specifically means like in or within. And so I can do that and, and, you know, figure out my forms and then kind of smash them together to be like this adverb that gets used over time because it, it seems silly that together would always be a, a full phrase. It seems like as an adverb, that would be something that would get said a lot. And then as a frequently used expression, it would get reduced until it became this, you know, adverb form that, that kind of lost all the individual pieces that you used to be able to see. Um, so I'm going to use one as the root, um, and I'm going to add my post position, uh, that means in, within, or inside, is sla. And so it's going to be something sla, and the the root itself will need to be marked in the locative. And so it, it will end up having the form either is or za, followed by the sla. So it's, it's going to get reduced a whole lot because za sla is well that can end up being kind of horrible over time so it'll it'll get reduced quite a bit um most likely the problem here is i don't have anything meaning one i haven't decided on numbers yet um one decision i did make which i think i posted in discord about one decision i did make was that the numbers in shwadi are actually going to be base 12 and if you know me then you know that that is incredibly radical because I love my base 10 counting systems. They make sense to me. I can do them. I can then create numbers and I can easily count things. Um, however, one of you, one of you patrons shared an article uh, about why base 12 was actually the most logical base. And it was really intriguing to me because it was like why, um, even though you know, English back in the day was, um, it, it was more of a decimal system. So it did have, um, the, the 20 system and yet it had a special word for 11 and 12 and then flipped over to the like 13, 14, 15. So it's like why 11 and 12 were special. Um, it also indicated, you know, was talking about why we have like dozen and then gross, which is a dozen dozen. And then you think about 12 being important in the sense of like time, you've got 12 hours twice a day for your 24 hour clock. So we've got a lot of things that are actually broken into 12s rather than 10s or anything else. And so the article, I don't remember all of the argumentation, but it actually walked through why 12 is super logical in terms of packing, in terms of addition and subtraction, in terms of all these things. And it made so much sense at the time that I read it that I decided Jwadi would be base 12. 
Now that doesn't mean anything for the number one because the number one was going to be created whether I needed a base 10 or a base 12. It was just I made this decision, but then I never actually created any number forms. So I do need to create those. Um, and one seems like a really good place to start. <laughs> And once I figure out what the root of one is going to be, it is going to be the root of together. And um, I'm going to take this phrase in one and, you know, meaning with that location marker to turn it into that locative meaning. It's going to mean together as a unit, one mind, one place. So that's what I'm going to do. Again, I don't think I'm going to do that on the stream because I'm, I'm aware of how time is flying as I'm talking about my strategies and I want to talk about the other things I need to translate. Um, and so that that will be step one is to get my and I'm actually making a note here to remind myself one plus locative followed by SLA and SLA meaning in within inside comes from SILA which means to hide. And so um, that's the, the original verb meaning. And I'm looking at some of my other ones just to see. Now, because the other one, the other one that means in is like to enter or to arrive. And I want to say like it's inside within a place. I think that makes more sense. Although I guess if you enter into one, even though there's movement, it does indicate a togetherness because you're at the same location at the end of it. If I do that, the form will be lay because that verb is um, la lay and it becomes reduced to the postposition lay. And that may end up being better phonologically than sla. So I'm going to leave that one open, sla versus lay, and I'm going to see what root I end up coming up with for one before I make that decision. But it's probably going to be lay because that's way easier to work with than sla. Um, that, that is a hefty postposition right there. Having having some conling or remorse on that form. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it happens, right? It happens. Uh, but also it seems like, um, you know, to hide makes sense as a verbal source for in, within, inside. When you think about like being inside something means that you can't see it from the outside. And so it's like it's hiding. And that makes sense, but it doesn't necessarily make sense to say we are doing this hiding in this place, um, it, it, entering in this place kind of makes more sense semantically. So anyway, I'm really just justifying that I'm probably going to use lay as that form um, because it's easier to work with. Hmm. All right, so that is we create joy together. I'm going to get that word together created um, tonight after the podcast. I'm totally going to make that happen, but that is my thought process of where I'm going. All right, the second one is that um, I'm going to translate I love you always and forever. This one, I, I actually am missing a lot of pieces. And so it's funny that this is my backup plan B. Like this is meant to be like, hey, this is the easiest route out. But hey, also I'm missing all of these components. I really make things harder on myself quite often. Um, but what I do have is that, you know, I'll, I'll have lay, which means you. It's going to be marked in some case. And um, right now, I don't know what case that's going to be in because I need to figure out the the valency for the verb to love. Um, and yet, as I say that, I now have a different idea. So so hang tight to that idea. But I do need to figure out if I have a verb root meaning love. I need to figure out the valency, um, how that's going to work to figure out what case to mark you in. Um, always and forever. I don't have any of that. I don't have phrasal coordination and I also don't have the words always forever. So I need to create all of that. Um, so in other words, out of I love you always and forever, I have I, you. Go ahead and laugh. Um, and so I need to figure this out. The idea I just had as I was talking out loud though, is that I have a noun form meaning love. I don't have a verb meaning to love yet. 
Um, and the noun form is actually based on the same root that joy comes from, the joie, my beloved joie root for joie dit. And in this context, so I'm not saying I won't eventually create a verb meaning love, but in this context, I think I want to change the construction. And instead of just saying, I love you, I think I want to say, I give love to you. And that is going to be easier by sense of translation. Um, and that would then take the form just one second, because lay you in this case, give love to you would be in the dative. And so that would be lays. I do have the verb to give and that is heza means to give. Um, and so I give and I want to mark it in the future because what I want to say is like, I will give love to you always and forever. Like not only have I, you know, past and present, like I want to really focus on the fact that this is Yes, you have it today, but tomorrow I'm going to be giving love to you as well. And so um, I'm going to mark it in the future tense. So heza. First and foremost, I'm going to, the prefix would be um, u because it's before a consonant. And that H is going to become a voiced velar fricative in between vowels. And so heza is going to become ureza. So that's going to be the root. And then the suffix un is the future tense. And that un interacts with the a ah of heza to turn into o. Oh. So raison is I will give. Okay, so I've got that. Love as a noun is zujwa, um, which is actually a fire class, I believe I'm double checking in my dictionary. Um, let me find where it is. Oh, you know what? It's a schwa at the beginning. Just a second. I had to remember what my root was here. Okay, so joa, solar heart, metaphorically speaking, and zujwa, is a fire noun class and it means that's where you get love. Okay, so I love you suddenly becomes zujuam les raison, which means I will give love to you. I am so happy with that. Okay, so I'm gonna, I, I'm taking notes here. I'm gonna do that. Always and forever, I have some ideas brewing, more adverbs that are very helpful but I don't have, have yet. Um, and I, here's my note here. Okay, so what I do have, um, so what I want to emphasize in using the words always and forever in Shwadi, I want to focus on the fact that one is saying like in all spaces, the other one is saying throughout time. And so like one is gonna focus on a spatial orientation, that's gonna be always. Forever is going to focus on a temporal interpretation and that's going to, to be the time. Um, and so for always, I'm going to actually build it on um, my root meaning path, um, which is meris. And that is um, a dirt class noun. Depending on phono phonology of how this comes together, I may actually end up using grass class marker to have two different words for path with slightly different interpretations. Um, and that would be charis. And so again, it's just gonna depend on which one sounds better. Um, but it's gonna be in the plural and I'm gonna have this one take the E plural, uh, which is like, a more metaphorical plural that can be applied to nouns where it's not like a grouping of paths, but it's like even as this path grows, um, you know, no matter how long it is. And I'm going to have the phrase actually come across, um, or sorry, come 
from, be sourced from, there we go. Uh, I'm going to have it from beyond the paths. And by paths in the plural, again, I don't mean like multiple paths. It's like beyond the path, even as it continues growing, I'm still going to love you. And so that's where always is going to come from. My post position, meaning beyond, is D. And so that's really quite helpful because that's a, a lovely form to work with, phonologically speaking. So ED is going to be kind of how it ends. Um, and so it's probably going to be something like Merizidi. Uh, and from there, it's probably it's going to be reduced, something like Mercidi or Meridi, um, something like that. And so it'll be reduced. And again, I, I'm reserving the option that it'll be uh, that I could make it a grass class instead and have something like charisti um, or, you know, charsidi, chasidi, something like that. And so um, I'm going to reserve those that option as I play around with those forms tonight. For forever, the root form is going to be a word meaning lifetime. And I have decided that for that, I'm going to use the ida base, which means to happen or to exist, and pop it into my, my noun um, classes to turn it into some nominal forms that mean something like time or instance, um, moment, those kinds of words. And I've decided that I want the animate noun class marker to turn this verb ida into a lifetime so it's sort of like a growing living thing metaphorically speaking is the lifetime of a person and so for the word forever it's going to literally break down to historically a phrase meaning past my lifetime and so um it's going to come from avidam mas is the full phrase and i think that'll probably end up being reduced to vidamas so Vidamas is probably going to be my word for forever. So I've got that. Yay. Okay. So that is those two missing pieces. I don't have a way to join anything. I don't have any coordination in Jwadi yet. And so for phrasal coordination, um, I definitely need that. Um, I had an idea where my... Phrasal coordination would come from something. Looking at all my notes, I know I had an idea somewhere. Um, yes. Okay, so my phrasal coordination I was thinking might come from my verb meaning to bundle or to like gather together. And to remind myself what that root actually is. Oh, it's from to tie, to tie together is the verb root, and that is um, karui, karui. Oh, that, you know what? It's going to be reduced. It's fine. Uh, its root form is actually kahui, and so it comes, it has that H in its protoform, um, and as a protoform, kahui. I could see that becoming something like kawi, kawi, kui. And so I may end up with something like um, kui. But that's also a postposition meaning around, I'm realizing. Hmm. Okay, I've got to think about that one harder. But that is one idea is to use to tie together or, um, you know, to, to do that. Another one was to see, I don't have a word for like to join. Um, so that's an idea. I'm apparently going to have to think about that one a little bit more because I've got to decide if I want my post position qui to also mean and, which is going to get used a lot. Although I guess if it's going to be used, you know what, as something that's super frequent, qui, qui, qui it probably would actually end up being reduced to key anyway. And key is a good little word for and. And so I'm, you know what, you know what, I'm going back to potentially saying, you know, tying these two things together um, will eventually potentially become key. 
and, but only for phrases. Okay, so overall, my lexicon for Shwadi is going to expand um, because I need words for together, always, forever, and I've got a good start on those. I need a couple more roots to, to finish those out, but I've got a good start. Um, and I actually made it so I don't even need to create something for it to love, so hooray, something I can push off for another day. Um, I will have to spend some more time thinking about and. Mm, that's going to take some work. All right, so let's talk about backup plan A. Oh my gosh, how has it already been 50 minutes? No, no way. I think I started much later than I thought I did. I'm fine. Um, okay, backup plan A, where I'm just doing My Love is Deeper Than the Holler and Longer Than the Song of a Whippoorwill. And I say only as I'm laughing because it's like, this is going to be a lot more intense. First of all, I have a lot of vocabulary needs for um, starting with just looking at my love is deeper than the holler. I already before this day had um, come up with the idea that I would take my word um, chadi, which means valley, and I would add a diminutive to it to create a meaning for holler because a holler is um, in the way that this is going to work, it's going to be understood as sort of um, a softer, gentler, smaller version of what a, you know, a valley is going to be much deeper, right, um, in this particular language. Um, in a lot of American regional dialects that have holler in it, that is sort of the understanding where like a holler is, is often in these regional dialects a... a um, kind of like a bowl in the land, a bowl instead of like a, a full valley. Um, and, and so it's it's often gentler, I will say, not necessarily as deep or steep as what you would get for a valley. So anyway, that's that's sort of how it works in, in my understanding of it anyway, um, and in my understanding of the, the hollers in our woods. <laughs> so it, that's how it's going to work in Shwadi. Um, so anyway, I have to decide um, the diminutive derivation, which if you recall with my nouns, I've got the class marking prefixes, I've got number marking suffixes, and then the case markers, which are much later. I want the diminutive and then eventually an augmentative um, to be very close to the root, I think. Um, and my current idea my current idea is to have a class marking prefix followed by any diminutive or augmentative um, prefixes before the root. And that then speakers would essentially reanalyze that diminutive or augmentative piece as being sort of an extension of the class marker. And so it's like, because the root itself is going to often be like a verbal root or things like that. And so this diminutive or augmentative um, form is actually going to be like, you know, it's it's in this case, by the way, chadi as valley comes from the root meaning to smile. And then the it's in the noun class of grass. So it's a grass class smile is a valley. Um, and so this is going to be like a little smile in the grass class. And so the diminutive form um, will be there. I have already decided that I think <laughs> I want my diminutive form to be grammaticalized from the noun baby, but I don't have baby yet, I don't think. I don't even think I have child. No, I don't have baby. Um, but Oh, I do have child, but I do not have baby. I specifically want baby for a couple reasons, and and really it was for one major reason, and I'll tell you that story in a second, but like as I, I searched baby in my document, now I have another reason. It's because I already had this idea that where baby as a grass noun is like seedling and as a stone noun means pebble, and so it already, I had this idea that as I put it into different noun classes, it was gonna be a little version of whatever it was in. 
And so it really makes sense that then it would be sort of reanalyzed over time as like, you know, it's a seedling of this, it's a pebble of that, um, which, which would make it a diminutive. So I, I'm very happy with my, my decision process here. So the reason I wanted to use baby as the diminutive marker is that um, when my son was young, um, I used to read this book to him that is, it was called Backyardigans and the, the Super Senses. Um, and so it's like each Backyardigan character, which they were these little animal characters that created entire worlds in their imaginations in their backyard. So they were called the Backyardigans. Um, and so, you know, they, they went on all these adventures and in this particular book, it was a TV show, by the way, this was a book based on the TV show. Um, the, in this particular book, they each take a role as like they're detectives, but they have a super sense. So there's someone who's like, can see really well. There's someone who can hear really well and so on. Um, and so I would read this book to my son quite often when he was really, really young. And when he started kind of reading the book back to me, he would flip through the pages and he would tell the story as he remembered it. Um, so he wasn't really reading, but page by page, he would remember, you know, roughly what the story was. And when he would get to the particular page where um, the characters are following this line of crumbs because they're chasing a muffin thief, someone stole a muffin. And so they are, are trailing this thief by following the, these crumbs of the muffin. And in this retelling of the story, um, my son called them, he said, and then they saw baby muffins um, because he, he couldn't remember the word crumb. And so he just called it a baby muffin. And I thought that was the most adorable thing ever. And I'm going to carry that over. And I'm actually going to, instead of having any sort of root meaning crumb in Shwadi, I'm going to actually have it be like baby whatever is going to be like a crumb of something. And so like that's going to make me very happy every time I think about it. Um, so anyway, that was why I wanted that to be the diminutive. I do, however, need a form for baby. So that is something I need to do. Um, I'm going to treat it as a modifier, which is why it's a prefix. And so, and I've already talked about it going between the class and the root. That is something that took a lot of decision, by the way. I've got these notes where I've said, no, it will be better as a suffix. Then I've crossed that out and gone, uh -uh, it actually is more of a modifier. So it kind of needs to be a prefix because that otherwise doesn't make sense. And so I've got all these notes that are like crossed out, recrossed out, and then crossed out again. <laughs> um, but I think I'm, I've settled on class prefix marker followed by the diminutive derivation followed by a root. So that's where I'm going to get holler from. Excellent. Now I, I'm also going to have to decide how, what word, what adjective, what phrasing I'm going to use for deep. Like in English, we say a valley is deep, but like that doesn't have to be the same across every language. So this is where I'm getting outside of the word for word translation and really thinking about how would my, my speakers refer to that concept. And I've got some ideas that I haven't narrowed down yet. Um, my ideas are one, like I think it makes more sense to say a value is low instead of deep. So I may come up with a, a way of saying low. Um, also, I was thinking about having this actually based off of verbal root, like it sinks more than the, you know, the holler. So my love sinks more or it slopes more or is steeper. And so those, those are different words I wanna play with. Mind you, I don't have low sink, slope, or steep in Shwadi yet, so I really need to semantically settle on my idea before I go creating words. Otherwise, I'm gonna create 20 words um, and the next 30 hours will be gone and I still won't have my way of saying deeper than the holler, but I'll have a lot of vocabulary. Um, but as I'm talking here, I think I like, Like I'm, I'm feeling sink and slope. Like those are the, the two I'm, I'm thinking. Um, and, and so I think I'm gonna play around with those concepts a bit more. So like my love slopes more than the holler or my love sinks more than the holler. 
um, instead of having like a, a copular construction there. And so that is where my brain is heading for that. In talking about that, I need a comparative construction. I don't have one in Shwadi. Um, comparative constructions, I think, are usually something we kind of <laughs> push off. <laughs> At least I do. And so that one I, I don't have. Um, and so if I do my love sinks more than the holler or slopes more than the holler, then I don't need to worry about the copular construction, which one would be appropriate because I've actually got three different ones in Shwadi. I don't have to worry about that if I ignore that altogether. The comparative though, I still very much need. I have two ideas brewing. One is that I use a postpositional phrase and say my love slopes. I'm going to stick with slopes for now. Sink. Sink makes more sense. I'm going to stick with sink for now. For now. I may totally change my mind in a moment, but let's just say sink. So my love sinks more than the holler would break down to um, something that essentially means my love sinks over the holler like and by over i mean like beyond so more than the holler does and so um this comes from my post position meaning over comes from the verb to shade and so it's like my love sinks shading the holler in this particular expression it doesn't make as much sense because it would make more sense if it were growing taller because then you'd be shading the thing that you have grown taller than right and so that's where the construction would come from if i go with this method um and so if I do that, ju means over. Um, and so I would have my love sinks. And then I would have a postpositional phrase, meaning, you know, like the holler ju. So like chari ju um, with my diminutive built in there. All right, so that's option one. Option two is to play around with this method that um, you may remember more recently in an episode. I was talking to David and I'm like, God, these applicatives, what are they even? Like I, my brain struggles with them. So I was like, you know what? How about I create one for Jwadi and like really force myself to, to get a better understanding. Um, for this particular applicative, um, it would be something where you would apply, um, you would have this prefix on a verb that would sort of turn an intransitive or a copular verb meaning into something that becomes transitive. Um, and in this case, I was thinking of using um, the verb to shine, specifically to shine because that's one of the three verbs that gives rise to a copular, uh, copular construction in Shwadi. And here the idea would be like, my love sinks, overshining the holler and so what that means is like it sinks and it it outshines the holler in its sinkingness it, it outdoes it it you know overperforms in, in this way and so it's it does it more um if i do that again over comes from um comes from the the verb meaning to shade uju is is to shade and shine is kayi in its root form um and well sorry that's its proto form uh it turns into ki long i in its modern form so that could become something like juki um which is very close to zuki but zuki doesn't mean anything zuko is who i was thinking of in avatar last airbender but anyway juki um could be my verb in this case if I choose to do that. And by verb, I mean it would end up being reduced into like sort of a overshining X. So it'd probably just be like, um, you know, chadijuki, uh, something like that. So those are my two options that I need to decide between. But I'm very happy with where this thought process is going. So that that's a good thing. To, to finish this thought off, I need and longer than the song of the whippoorwill, which is going to require figuring out a word for whippoorwill. I don't have a word for that particular bird yet. 
Um, I need to figure out how I would describe that a song is long. Um, because again, we, we call songs long uh, when they go, go on for a certain amount of time in English. But in other languages, you could describe them as other things, including, for instance, the word for tall and long are the same in Finnish, where it's like you, you know, say a tall man and a long song. Those adjectives are the same. And so, um, which I suddenly forget, I think pika is tall and long. I may be misremembering that, so don't quote me on it, but it's like, you know, pika mies or um, pika laulu whatever that that adjective is it's exactly the same but like you apply it to both and it means either long or tall so i need to figure out how i want to do that and actually the long tall thing would totally work in shwadi as well because time has a metaphor of a tree where it grows upwards and so if something is tall then it lasts for a longer time and so that would actually make a lot of sense Hmm, so I might say it's taller than the song of a whipper well. I have a word for song, so that's awesome. Um, but I don't have clausal coordination. However, I do have an idea where um, clausal coordination um, would actually come from uh, the, the verb meaning to sow. And I know I have that one. And so like you sew things together. It's so, like sort of a, and then this where it's sewing it onto the previous thing. And um, that is June is that word. And so like, and it comes from Dion as um, its proto form. And so like, I could see that becoming um, shortened before the um, dun, dun, du, like probably being something like du um, as, a, um, as a coordinator. So I might have ki as a phrasal coordinator and du as a clausal coordinator. I may have just figured this out. So for expansion here, I do need to figure out baby. Um, so I can use that as a diminutive to finish out my word for holler. I need to figure out this deep issue. I think sink may 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 fill that that slot. Whippoorwill, I need a word for that. It's going to definitely be like either a compound or, you know, some sort of like phrase where it's actually like a, a phrase for the whip or will. So I do have a, a word for songbird though. So I can like kind of play with that and maybe make it a nighttime songbird um, because they only sing in the night. So like I, I can play around with that and potentially um, get a phrase that will end up sort of being a compound form. Long, I think I'm going to go with tall because I think I talked myself into that. And then and I think I, I'm going to use so and use that form for an and marker. So I've got that. All right, so really from there, if I end up doing all that, you know, tonight and having a lot of extra time tomorrow, uh, <laughs> really laughing at myself at this point, um, you know, my ultimate goal to do that whole chorus, I do have a variety of vocabulary needs. Um, including I would want to get my augmentative derivation set. So, you know, like this one will require um, my diminutive, but I would also like an augmentative form, especially for um, some of the words that I'll end up needing. Um, I will need to finish out thinking through what are appropriate description words, like I had to think through the deep and long of, of the first two lines. Um, and specifically, I need to think about what I want to do with late December. Um, because, you know, I am not going to have the same 12 months. Um, and so I don't even think I'm going to have necessarily months. There, there will be the concept of like a lunar cycle. Um, but late December won't track for Joadi. Um, and so I may end up saying early winter or beginning of winter because late December is actually the beginning of winter. Um, and so I will have seasonal words because seasons will be incredibly important. I'm probably going to be compounds, um, at their core. 
uh, where it's like, you know, snow season and, you know, sun season or something like that. And so I think early winter is probably what I would do for that particular phrasing or beginning of winter. In terms of other constructions, not only am I going to need to really nail down this comparative construction that I've been talking about, but I'm also going to need to get an equitive construction because it's as honest as a robin on a, a springtime window sill is one of the lines. And so it's not more honest than, it's as honest as, which is the equitive. And so I do have an idea for that. Um, my current idea is, never mind. I thought I had an idea written down. Oh, I do. Here it was. I was it was in my notebook. Um, is to use the postposition until. So like you, um, you know, you you are honest until the robin. So up to the robin, and that means like you're you're even with the robin in honesty. Okay, so that that was my idea there. Um, I do have a a postposition meaning until. So like that that would be you know done and done, except for the rest of the words. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I do need a relative clause structure because there is a relative clause and there's also a modifying participial phrase. Um, the participial phrase I think will end up being just like a non-finite form of the verb, so no subject agreement, um, no tense. Um, and, you know, so it'd just be like a root form of a verb at that point being used as a modifier. And I think that's how I'm going to end up doing the, the participial. But I do need to kind of figure out placement and if I'm going to have heavy modifiers actually follow the noun instead of precede them like other modifiers. Um, I also, I have outlined a relative clause structure I'm interested in. Um, where I have a relativizer based on the verb meaning to weave. So it's like you say something and then you say like weaving this in, uh, you weave it into to some more details about it. So you can see I have a lot of metaphors with trees and growing tall for time and then things that are connected. I've got a lot of tying and sewing and weaving kind of um, metaphors going on, uh, like I, crafts and yarn products. I love them. And so they're going to become like a, a key source of inspiration for this language. It's going to be a lot of yarn metaphors. Um, to actually do my entire goal, my lexical expansion would need to include words for river, strong, pine tree, high, hill, pure, fall, late December, robin, honest, springtime, window, and sill. In other words, like if you heard the chorus, I've got the function words mostly, most of the content words I don't have. Uh, and so this will be quite the exploration. Um, and one thing about translating though, that I, I really do enjoy is because it kind of forces the issue uh, for you to think about, okay, this is how English describes it or does it. How is my language going to do it? And once I make that decision, I need to create all the words to actually support that decision. And so for instance, being able to say, okay, I'm gonna do a comparative where, where this is going to happen. Um, I can't just say that, I actually have to create the words built into it. I need to create the lexical sources. I need to make sure that these, these units are, are coming together. And so um, that's one of the way, one of the reasons that I really enjoy using translation to, to get my language to grow. Um, it also gives me a purpose for the growth of the language. I think sometimes it can be quite difficult to sit down and just say, I'm going to work on my language today um, because there's so much that I could be working on that it's like my brain shuts down and I'm like, gosh, I don't even know where to go with this. However, when I'm translating, you know, even if it's just like a sentence or a particular construction, when I'm translating, I have a goal, I have a purpose in mind. And then I'm also like, as I'm doing it, I'm creating an example. So that way it's like an example I can then use, um, you know, in my grammar document to say, this is, this is how it works. And um, I think that's super exciting. And so I've got to start here. I hope you've enjoyed my meandering thought process of a podcast. I think <laughs> I feel like this is um, a kind of bizarre podcast of verbal thoughts, um, but I 
for me and myself, I feel really solid about some of the decisions I'm making here. Um, It's a matter of actually doing them and getting them done. When I post this episode, I will post the uh, keynote presentation that if you know you watch the video eventually that I have used to kind of talk through ideas and you can follow along on that. So you'll get to see the PDF of that keynote presentation. Um, and um, I will also share what translation I actually got done. And so I will I will include that as a document so that way you can see what I ended up doing um, and connect it with how my thoughts were going as I talked here. And you can see where I end up changing my mind because chances are between now and actually getting these lines translated, something else will change because that's just how it goes in conlanging. But I hope you enjoyed it and I'm excited to see how this all works out. And um, I hope you, you all stay grammar, you know, stay grammar until next time. And uh, we'll see you on Thursday. Bye everyone.